Good morning, everyone, or good evening, or, you know, good afternoon, I guess. Wherever time you happen to be watching this and wherever place, I'm just excited to have you here for this episode of a new thing. And, uh, yeah, let's jump right into it. Let's get started here. Our Bible verse for today is this passage from John 21. A famous story, right? Who doesn't know the story of jesus and the miraculous catch a fish uh this is the niv version um but uh you know whatever so afterwards jesus appeared again to his disciples by the sea of galilee it happened this way simon peter thomas also known as didymus nathaniel from cana and galilee the sons of zebedee and two other disciples were together i'm going out to fish simon peter told them and they said we'll go with you so they went out got into the boat but that night they caught nothing Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him it is, say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore, and it was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. So, uh, famous story, right? I think a lot of people don't usually forget that this happens at the end of Jesus' ministry. Um, this is usually uh, something that's kind of associated with, I think, where people usually think it's happening during or even before and things like that. But this is an event that happens at the end, and they don't realize it's it's uh, it's Jesus at first, right? So there's a lot of really interesting commentary. You also have the walk to Emmaus where something similar happens, right? Like two people who are followers of Jesus are walking, and Jesus ends up walking with them after he's been resurrected, and he he's not instantly recognizable to people, but he can kind of once he reveals himself, or once you realize, you instantly see that it's him, right? Um, and sometimes he's instantly recognizable to people, like in it, like when he appears to Mary in the garden and things like that, right? People could tell. Uh, but you, so you have, so this has caused all sorts of conversation about like what does Jesus's resurrected body look like and things like that. One of the things though that I wanted to talk about here um, is, and I really wanted to focus on because you'll see this becomes important for my main topic today, is usually like one of the things that's really important about Jesus <laughs> And this is an important thing, is that he became incarnate, right? You hear that word a lot, incarnate, right? He was the incarnate son of God, right? The incarnation. What does that mean? Well, in Latin, right, it means to take on flesh, to be incarnated. Carne is, is uh, flesh. So to be in the flesh, right? God in the flesh. And again, you might be like, okay, well, what's the big deal about that? Well, one, it's a big deal because it shows several things. The first thing it shows is that God humbles himself, right, and becomes one of us through the Son and is able to uh, live our lives in a perfect way and die as the perfect unblemished sacrifice for our sins, right? So that's a very important part. That's why we can refer to Jesus as like the Paschal Lamb, see above, right? So this is an important concept when it comes to thinking about who Jesus is. And so I think, you know, one, very important. But two, it's also really important because it, it matters for the resurrection. And it also matters uh, for how we see ourselves. So the resurrection, right? Some people, like wacko people, who I think I've talked about before on the channel, <laughs> have, have said stuff like Jesus actually didn't, he was a spiritual resurrection, right? He didn't actually rise from the dead. And that's not Christian teaching, right? That is clearly uh, heretical, um, if not just non-Christian 
at, at the beginning because the base assumption of someone like Paul is that a Christian is someone who confesses that Jesus is Lord and believes that he was raised from the dead. Right? So you have to believe that Jesus is God and that he was raised from the dead. Those are the basic tenets of the Christian uh lifestyle right uh, that th from that everything else will flow you'll want to live like christ you want to read the word all that stuff right you'll want to pray etc so th the physical resurrection is really important and this story shows right this is john like even makes a point to say this to people in verse 12 right none of the disciples dared ask him who are you right it's not as though they're, they're seeing a ghost or something they knew it was the lord they knew he was there and then he, he does this, right? He takes the bread and he gives it to them and did the same with the fish. So he eats with them, something that is, is again, not something that you would expect him to have to do, right? But this is just to show that he has physicality. He's actually, you know, doing it with them, right? So he's, he's, uh, he's there, he's in person. He's not a ghost walking around or whatever. And this is a big deal because, um, one of the earliest things like in that culture at the time they a lot of people believed the body was an evil thing right and that it's something that like the spirit or the mentality of comes first and the body is just an outer shell this is a big thing in greek thought and especially in gnosticism which is just a, a which is kind of like a philosophical religious thing going on at, at the time and uh and already, like, you'll see this in um, pretty early in the church that people begin to hear about Jesus and they begin to think that he's some sort of Gnostic teacher. And in, so, like, in the 100s AD and the 200s AD, you start to have texts being made where Jesus will just say stuff like, uh, you know, you, you have to be a man in order to get into heaven. I think I've talked about that on the channel before, too. Um and, and like you have to die, like your body is not important, right? All that matters is your spirit. They, they even believe the God of the, quote unquote, the God of the Old Testament, who we would just say is God and Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. But the God of the Old Testament is actually an evil God who created the world and um, made things physical. And Jesus is here to set us free from that, right? So really wacko stuff. But all of that fall like all of that hinges on this idea that Jesus is more interested or only didn't really actually rise from the dead as a spirit uh, as as a body excuse me didn't actually rise from the dead as as a bodied person um and this is you see this being hit again and again and again in the Pauline epistles right because we have the resurrection of the dead it's something that we believe in the in the creeds right we look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life everlasting is that it's not we're going to our goal is not to get to heaven and be little disembodied souls right that's not at all what, what we're looking for what we're actually looking for is to be raised up in bodies and live in bodies with the lord for the rest of of, of eternity right in the city uh, in the in the in the kingdom of heaven in the city of heaven that is going to actually come down to earth we're not going up there it's coming down to us right very important thing to to, to talk about the reason this is important is for today's topic, um, and uh, and it's because sometimes when we have other concerns, usually political concerns or things like that, we can end up downplaying the importance of his incarnation and even how God identifies himself in order to make points or make ourselves feel better or even to make our faith more appealing to the world. And what I mean by this is one of my friends uh, from seminary uh, sent me this. This somehow snuck by me. <laughs> I'm not sure how it did. I mean, I actually, you know, I try to avoid our denominations Facebook page as much as I can, to be honest with you. But uh, I, he sent this to me. This is this came out a few days ago, and it's the it, and it uh, it's it's just, it is a passage from John. Big scare quotes on that on that one. Well, the the Spanish version is fine, and we'll talk about kind of my problem. But what this revealed to me between not only the Spanish version and the English version is that our denomination, the PCSA. I've sparred a lot with them, as you guys know on the channel. And I want to be very clear, this isn't bitterness. This isn't uh, hatred. 
this is very much a reformer spirit in me. And it's very sad to see kind of where the denomination has ended up and from its history and how the, the putting of political concerns above the gospel has really hindered their ministry and kind of made us a laughing stock among other denominations. And I think appropriately so. I mean, it's really sad when I go online and I'm engaging with other Christians and they just assume that all Peace USA churches are just these dens of of political propaganda and a waste of time and that we're not real Christians. It's really sad when when that happens. But at the same time, I also completely understand what they're saying when our church publicly and proudly does this and is supported by many of its members in the comments because they've been catechized to care more about politics than to care about the actual faith. And so um, this is a, a quotation from the Gospel of John. And I, I want to put that in quotes because this is a translation like the Message Bible is a translation, except the message never claims to be one to its credit. Uh, the English version here is this, this is a famous passage, right? John 3.16. Almost all of us could recite it from memory. God so loved the world as to give the only begotten one so that whoever believes may not die but have eternal life. John 3.16. Now, really, so firstly, I just want to, I think here, first of all, let's, let's give this a massive angry face. Let's do that together. Um, firstly, when we look at this, right, what do we see? Well, for, well, it's eliminated gender, right? They give the only begotten one instead of son. Now, I did some background in this, and I, I looked up the, this is, comes from the Inclusive Bible, the first egalitarian translation by Priests for Equality, which is this group of Catholic, kind of like uh, um, political Catholic priests uh, outside of something called the Quixote House, which is kind of like this left-wing Marxist uh, publishing and uh, thought tank, think tank, Catholic think tank in Maryland. Um, just to give you an idea of who these people are, if you remember the eighties, like they were big supporters of the Sandinistas in Nicaragua. Uh, and, uh, so that kind of reveals where they're at politically and this influenced their translation of the Bible. And, um, I couldn't, I, 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 I couldn't find a, um, <laughs> an online version of it that I could show you guys, like a free version. Uh, funnily enough, the super communists make you pay. So I bought it, and I'm going to be doing a bigger review of it next week. Uh, but one of the things that that is upsetting about this for me isn't even the background, right? Because, you know, probably what I'll talk about next week is how we bring our context into the Bible translations and how that can mess with it. But the idea here is that by sacrificing political or sacrificing theological things for political ones, we end up creating a faith that is shallow and that is a timely and can be taken away and ultimately contradictory to itself. Now, because I could not find the translation online, right? I, I don't know what's going on. I do know that I was able to find a little after this, the next two verses, and they do kind of clarify something that is really bad about this, but still it, it's not enough to kind of make up for it because it'll go on to say, you know, you have to, anyone who, you have to believe in the only begotten one to be saved. That's what they'll say. But you'll see that the, the, the reason this was chosen, this translation was chosen, and you'll see people in the comments of this post praising the idea that this is gender neutral, right? That it doesn't define Jesus as the son or doesn't even refer to him as him, right? So as you know, the, 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 the normal translation of the Gospel of John pretty much across all different translations is God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever believes in him may not perish but have eternal life, right? May not die, have eternal life. You'll see all the hymns that were cut out there. And I think that that was done, obviously, when they wrote this inclusive Bible, right, from a very... And by egalitarian here, I think they mean like flattening, not like uh, usually when you hear that used in Christian circles, it refers to the roles of men and women. I don't think that's all at all what that is because this is this inclusive Bible goes back to, I think, the 90s or something. Um, 
And so, uh, like here, it's it's just about. I looked at the site, and it's basically about you know viewing God in, in a radically different way, and in not wanting to turn people off with gendered language. And I've heard that a lot. Um, I've seen that a lot. That's a big thing in in the Princeton Theological Seminary. And I've never really understood that argument. I mean, I get it. I understand. But I also think that if someone is, and, and this is a big part of my ministry too, you'll notice that in the past, some people have like maybe wanted to become members, but they've sometimes demanded or wanted things of me beyond, you know, my normal thing. Like they want me to come kowtow to them or whatever in order to beg them to become members. One of the things that I'm really big on is that you do not dictate the terms of Jesus's call to you. Right. You do not say, I will only accept Jesus if he checks off these boxes for me. Right. What does Jesus continually say to people? He says, follow me. Right. And then they give an excuse as to why they can't. And he says, let the dead bury their dead. Moving on. Right. He doesn't sit around and try to beg people to follow him. He just says, follow me and you do it or you don't. And that's that's the end. So if someone were to come into church and say, you know, I really wish I could be a Christian. But the fact that God uses male pronouns for himself and that Jesus is referred to as son as a son is just so upsetting to me that I can't become a Christian. I'd be like, great, don't, right? Um, because what this ends up doing is this creates a God in your own image. Um, and uh, it, it ends up cheapening the incarnation, right? Because what does this do? It divorces Jesus from his body. Now, God could have come down, right? It could have decided that he wanted to incarnate as a female. He'd be wealth in his power to do that. But in his plan and who he is, he seems to identify as, you know, he uses some women, uh, feminine characteristics to define himself, right? In the Old Testament, he talks about himself as a nursing mother. And in the New Testament, he talks about himself as a mothering hen, right? And that's fine, right? God is a spirit. He's not gendered in the same way we are, but in the, sa in the same ta way, we have to admit that he takes on masculine characteristics and he is well within his right to do so, right? That is how he defines himself. It's not that he hates women. In fact, he makes women in his own image the same way he makes men. It's just that he identifies himself as male and this really shouldn't be a problem, especially in a culture that is now all about self-identification. But for whatever reason, God doesn't get that benefit. Um, and as we said, like when you do this, this, this teaches people subliminally that the body doesn't really matter, right? Because if Jesus, it, it was just a, it's not, it's just a happenstance that Jesus was male. It doesn't matter that he's supposed to be in the line of David and a king of Israel. And those are masculine positions, right? It, all, all of that ends up falling away. And the text becomes something to suit the ideas of the reader rather than, what the text originally is saying and what the Apostle John is trying to communicate to people who are reading it. And here's the big kicker, and this is where you know our denomination is deeply unserious. Because the the English version is this. But let's go to the Spanish version. Now, I'm not, I don't speak Spanish. So, I, I mean, I took like a million years of school for it. It's like one of those things where if I sit there and listen, I can kind of understand. But I know enough Latin that I can kind of look at any romance language and kind of get a gist of it. Um, and I've spent enough time that I, I know it, but you don't even have to be great at Spanish. You could do Duolingo like the first 10 lessons and you could see probably the problem and the difference between these two versions. So uh, it says here, Por que de tal manera amo Dios al mundo, right? And this is for, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, the love of God for the world, right? Because of the love that God had for the world. Que uh, a a su hijo. So he gave his son. Hijo is son in Spanish, right? It could be child, but that becomes pretty clear uh, when you uh, see how it defined him. Unigenito, right? So it 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 it's masculine there. Unigenito. Para que todo aquel que en él cree no se pierda más tenga vida eterna. So an el cre, so believes, cre, that's where we get creed, right? Creo in Latin, credo in Latin is I believe. So that in Spanish, it be, if they drop the D, it becomes cre. Um, and el, him, who believes, so whoever believes in him, cre el, en el cre, no se pierda mas tenga vida eterna, right? Will not die, but have eternal life. 
So the, in their Spanish version, they keep the uh, masculine language. And that's because, you know, there, there are lots of Spanish speaking churches in the PCUSA, which is great. Love that. Um, lots of Korean churches as well. Um, but you'll notice that they keep it there. And that's because Spanish language churches tend to be, I would say, and I don't like using this word because it's, it implies political things when it really shouldn't, but more conservative in their treatment of the faith than a lot of the English speaking churches in, in our domination are. So they hide the eight ball. So imagine if only you speak Spanish, you would be misled by kind of the things our denomination is doing in English. Um, and uh, instead of having a consistent, right, they don't even become like these guys, like these like radical, like Marxist Catholic priests. Instead, what they do is they just pretend, they do that in English and then for everyone else pretend that they're not, right? Or they're duping all of us in English and not actually they're thinking this way, but for the, for the Spanish and maybe Korean churches, they're, they're doing normal things, right? It's really uh, deeply unserious that, that they do that and it's very upsetting. And it's just another reminder that we as a denomination really need a big reform movement and something we should pray for uh, within it. Um, and so I, I think that uh, th that's what I wanted to say about that. It's just, I'll do a fuller review of this. I bought a physical copy of it because I love having deficient Bibles on my shelf. I mean, I have the Reader's Digest Bible, which is hilarious. Um, and so it, I bought this in another translation um, that people who like this were recommending just so I could see kind of where some people are getting their stuff and to judge whether or not they're good translations. Um, and, uh, and so I just, uh, you know, just, uh, we'll find out more about the inclusive Bible next week. What I want to do is I really want to look at their great commission and whether or not they say baptize them in the name of the father, the son, and the Holy spirit and how they do that. Because obviously right there, again, you have very poignant language that's in the text and can't be ignored. It's in the Greek. It's not like. You can't, you can't ignore it. So I, I was just wondering what, what they're going to do with that. So anyway, I want to move on to my next thing. This is from our, my friend who sent me that article. You'll remember a few weeks ago I did a – I answered a question about an article and um, it had to do with like uh, the, the saving of a child through science. And I talked about how, you know, barring the fact that it's not an evil – some evil scientific practices going on, that it's completely fine to do that. Um, this is his response to that. Um, and I really appreciate this. I, my friend, uh, who sent this to me is, is not a Christian, um, and is an atheist. And so I really appreciate him engaging me in this way. Um, and engaging my listeners who may, you guys might not interact with people who think differently from you. You should. Uh, and so this is a great way to do that. So this was his response to my video. So he says, all right, maybe this is a brand new question for you in a wider scope with talking about gene editing, bypassing things previously you had to deal with this hardship. So he gives a scenario, right? Five years ago, a baby dies from an incurable disease. The parents are forced to deal with the loss and it affects their faith tremendously likely. And I would agree. I mean, um, I, I could not imagine someone who whose child would die and that wouldn't affect kind of every part of their being, not just their faith. They suffer just like many do in the Bible, like Job. Today, the same baby is cured. The family pays some money and moves on and treats it as a miracle. Why are we not affecting their life journey except for a brief panic? Uh, and, uh, this actually kind of attaches to that story. I remember kind of clearly, I think it was like twin girls or maybe one's a little bit older. I can't remember, but the other one, I think it was just one was a little bit older. The other one couldn't get the treatment cause she was too old and the treatment is new, right? So you have a really weird situation in the family, sad, where the older daughter is going to die from the disease, but the younger daughter can get the gene therapy and live. And so, you know, very tragic. Um, and he talked and here, you know, it's kind of a commentary on how we're so easily treated, right? That, you know, it's just treated. I don't know if it's actually treated as a miracle, <laughs> um, by a lot of people. I actually think they end up just seeing it as something that is part and owed to them. Um, but let's just say they do like they have my vision for it, right? We treat it as something great. Uh, and then, uh, it doesn't affect their life journey because it doesn't cause them to go through this existential crisis or something. That to me seems like a big difference. I agree, I think it is. As we use medicine and other tech to reduce difficulty in life, where does spiritual growth come from? If you're born into a world where we have eliminated all problems, why have faith? Doesn't there need 
to be some hardship in the world for people to turn to God. So I think, um, I think here that this 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 is a good question. Uh, I think that I, I'm going to answer the second question first because I think that'll set up how I deal with the other ones, and you'll just see that once I answer that one, the other ones kind of not that they don't make sense, but that they just they're irrelevant. So if you're born into a world where we have eliminated all problems, why have faith? I think a core conviction of the Christian world is that that is a Christian lifestyle and, and belief system worldview is that that is not a, a possible thing that there is no play. There is no utopia on this earth. That's the sin has marred everything, right? Because you're never going to be able to, to cure death. Um, and I think that that's, fairly a clear thing i think uh people will die i think that things are going to happen um natural disasters uh i i don't have a view of the future where science is going to be able to stop these things i think it has an upper limit on a lot of these problems i think covid19 is a great example of this i mean I, for a lot of people uh many people believe that there would be no way uh now i know that there are some medical people, epidemiologists who completely believe this was a possibility. Um, but there were a lot of the people who said, you know, the time of great diseases is over. Uh, we've been able to move on from that. Um, our medical technology is so good uh, that, you know, this is not something we have to worry about uh, a lot. And I know that because I was kind of, I was one of those people. Um, you know, I, I don't, you know, and of course, COVID-19 isn't uh, Ursinia pestis, right? It's not the bubonic plague. It didn't kill at that rate. But I have no doubt that like that is a possibility in the future. And I think that COVID-19 for a lot of people was a great wake up call for the fact that, you know, medicine has an upper limit. And I think if you spend a lot of time in hospitals and things like that, you really see that firsthand. There really is only so much that medicine can do. Um, and you know, maybe miracle treatments will make that happen. But I think that I would never see a world where there wouldn't be problems. Um, and faith isn't something you have to deal with problems, right? It's a uh, belief that in something uh, in God, right? And spiritual growth does come through testing. I think that that's, that's, that's right there. A lot of it does come from that, but like not only through difficult, great difficult situations, although that that's a good way to really, you know, put the pedal to the metal if you want to use that phrase right um and and so i think you don't need hardship to turn to god because not everyone turns to god in times of hardship i did um but that i haven't seen that as being a consistent thing i i just think that uh, it, it is one of the ways that people do turn to him but many people turn to god uh, out of being convinced or out of some miraculous thing that happened in their life that they weren't expecting or things like that uh and often turning to God does bring hardship. Uh, and so one of the things is about the Christian life is that you can't escape it, that uh, suffering is a part of this world and actually suffering is a good um, thing. Not in the sense of like a morally good as in like, like it's a pleasing thing to go through or something, but it ends up leading to growth. And so it's not, in, it's not a bad thing. This would be like contrasted with Buddhism, right? Um, the second part of your questions here, do Christians believe that God is providing tech to solve these problems? Do they believe he intentionally gave it to the kid to begin with? Why now in 2023 would God allow this disease to be cured easily and all babies go to suffer terribly and die? Why did it not create us with faults to begin with? Why, why not create us without faults to begin with? Or is my assumption that he is involved in any of this from a Christian perspective incorrect? All right, I'm getting someone at the door. This is what happens when you record live. I'll be right back. <laughs> I'll cut this. And it was nobody. Love that. <laughs> it was literally nobody. I went there, and there was nobody there. Uh, all right, let's let's get back to this. Um, why not create us without fault? It's my assumption that he's involved in any of this from a Christian perspective incorrect. He's just sitting back and watching and judging our actions in a world he does not doesn't control. If that's the case, then why pray? I feel like my question is, what does and does not God control in the physical world? Um, so all of these are great questions, and I really could do a deep dive into all of them. Um, since you kind of, maybe I will. If you want me to focus on any of these in particular, you can ask me to. But I guess because you you kind of sum it up at, at the bottom, what does and does not God control in the physical world? So I would say that no Christian 
uh, would say that God sits back and does nothing, right? Um, and that he's he's not in control in some greater sense. Each denomination, each strain of Christianity, of, I would say legitimate Christianity, Catholic, Orthodox, various Protestant traditions, have different ways of talking about this, but none of them deny that God is in control of things. Just where he where he's at when it comes to human will is where we differ a lot. Now, I am Reformed. Presbyterians are Reformed. And Reformed Christianity puts a big emphasis on God's sovereignty, right? His role as king and ruler of the universe. And that means that he has a plan for everything and that his he does things. And so we actually reject the concept of free will as it's commonly understood. And rather, we have this idea of agency that humans have agency right but our will has been so corrupted by sin that we're naturally not good people and so what we when we choose to do things we choose to sin against god and that's what what we are like as people but god has through the holy spirit sanctifies us right through common grace to all people helps them make good decisions and things like that right so we put a lot of emphasis on god's control so no reformed christian um who's steeped in the tradition and worth their salt would say that god's is like some clockmaker right that he uh a watchmaker god right as some people kind of will be where he steps back and just set the universe in motion and sits there um on his throne or whatever right like galactus above the earth or something and just judges people's for their actions um and uh and so uh now the case of why we pray um is prayer i think is often popularly misunderstood as uh something you know you would do in order to get something from god um prayer in the bible uh, certainly has an aspect of asking and requesting things of God, but it's mostly for communion with him, for engaging in a relationship. The second parts of that are 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 to, to ask for things, but largely it's to really see things the way that he is. And I, you can see this in the in the Lord's Prayer, right? The, the prayer that Jesus says, right? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You can see the beginning, right? It, it relates us to God in a personal way through your father and the first thing he says is is let your will be done let us help you let us see it things like that and then it moves later on to requests right give us today our daily bread forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors or forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sinned against us right and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil so you have all of those all of those requests in there that's a part of it but you get to the request after you've com understood where you're at so you pray to god for a relationship to be in a relationship with the creator you don't pray uh for things so um that's also a part of it and so for reformed christians that's big but i don't just make this up right this is this is out of nowhere like this is all over the bible i would say it's obvious and i would say that anyone who disagrees with this isn't paying attention to scripture but i digress um this is from my old testament so isaiah 45 and this is uh god talking and we're just going to do the first seven verses here and i think you're going to be really interested in the seventh verse so this is what this, the lord says to his anointed to cyrus who is right hand i take hold of to subdue nations before him and to strip kings of their armor and to open doors before him so that the gates will not be shut i will go before you and will level the mountains i will break down the gates of bronze and cut through the bars of iron so the lord is cyrus right cyrus is the king of persia cyrus the great and uh the lord here refers to him as the anointed one which is actually the messiah the messiah now it's a different version and different type like this is not the same thing that's you know talked about later but just that he's anointed cyrus to do these things and you can see that god isn't stepping back right he's deeply involved in history here's a historical character that uh, you know whether you believe that this is written later or written and you know god really isn't behind it clearly the people who you know isaiah or we as christians believe that god was acting through history through the person of cyrus in order to do these things right and the lord says he's going to help cyrus do this right he's going to act in history too i will go before you and will level the mountains i will break down the gates of bronze and cut through the bars of iron i will give you hidden treasures rich riches stored in secret places so that you know that i am the lord the god of israel who summons you by name so that you know cyrus will know this and this 
bears itself out in the historical record in so fact that Cyrus frees the Jews to go back to the Holy Land from the Babylonian captivity, right? Which is why he, he was seen as one of God's anointed ones. For the sake of Jacob, my servant, of Israel, my chosen, I summon you by name and bestow on you a title of honor that you do not acknowledge me, right? He's talking about Cyrus here, right? I am the Lord and there is no other. Apart from me, there is no God. I will strengthen you, though you have not acknowledged me, so that from the rising of the sun to the place of its setting, people may know there is none besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other. I form the light and create darkness. I bring prosperity and create disaster. I, the Lord, do all these things. So here, right, he, he's, this is a really good example of how Christians view, especially Reformed Christians view God's working in the world, right? That he works in all places, in all types of people, right? Even non-believers and things like that. He's deeply intimate in their lives, even if they might not see it and helps them to do the things that they're doing, right? It's part of his common grace to, to all people. Um, and here he does that for Cyrus. But in verse seven, right, this is where it talks about like, where, where it comes to the problem of evil. And the big problem that the reform, every different tradition usually has one problem uh, with their theology, like the one bullet that they have to bite that a lot of people don't like to bite or whatever. And for reformed theology, it's that God has a hand in the, in the difficult, sad, and terrible things of life, right? Uh, you know, if people are killed and uh, brutally murdered and attacked in something in Nigeria, right? Or if there's an earthquake in Turkey, or if you, you know, your daughter is killed by a drunk driver, um, that the Lord planned out and, and uh, what those things happen um and uses them for a greater purpose right that is that is a very challenging thing for a lot of people to hear it really requires you to understand god and his purposes and who he is to really get there um but you can see that strongly in verse seven right i form light i create darkness right i bring prosperity and create disaster i the lord do all of these things right so he isn't sitting back detached from the world he's he's deeply involved um I know that doesn't answer all your questions. I just wanted to, to answer that last one, just just to say, you know, the one you summed it up. And if you want me to go deeper in, I can uh, I can do that for you. One of the things that, if you want to get like a poetic <laughs> way to do this, there's this famous poem called "Just a Weaver," and I have no idea. This this site says Benjamin Malika Franklin, Malisha Malika Franklin, something wrote it. Um, we don't. I don't know who wrote it. It's been like quoted everywhere. But it's a really good poem, uh, but it's from the early 1900s. And this is, I would say, from a, a reformed Christian perspective of how we view God, right? So uh, it's called Just a Weaver, and I'll read it for us. And then this is how I'll end it. Um, My life is but a weaving between the Lord and me. I cannot choose the colors. He worketh steadily. Oft times he weaveth sorrow, and I in foolish pride forget he sees the upper, and I the underside. Not till the loom is silent and the shuttle cease to fly shall God unroll the canvas and explain the reason why. The dark threads are as needful in the weaver's skillful hand as the threads of gold and silver in the pattern he has planned. He knows, he loves, he cares. Nothing this truth can dim. He gives his very best to those who choose to walk with him. So that's, that's uh, in, in so many ways how we view God, right? That he is a weaver and that we do not see the full picture and that we aren't owed answers by him for the things, right? But that this will become clear when we are able to see his will as ours. Um, and that isn't the only answer from uh, Christian theology, but that's the one that I've seen to be the most biblical and the one that's meant the most to me in my life, right? You can't trust anyone else. The only one you can trust it because other people will fail you, people die, things happen. Right, the only one who will always be with you and understands what's going on is the Lord, um, and that even you can uh, be misled and mislead yourself, and so you can't even really trust yourself sometimes. So, a great question. Uh, thank you for sending it. If you want me to dive deeper, uh, you know, hit me with those questions, um, and I'd love to talk about them. Um, yeah, you guys have a wonderful rest of your day. Uh, enjoy your Thursdays, and I will see you. Uh, you know sometime in the future, I suppose. Uh, yeah, Sunday for worship. Why not that? All right, peace out, everyone. Have a good one.